Word. So today's session is being hosted by Michelle Courtney from Technical Services and Sam Harlow and Melody Rood from Research Outreach and Instruction. So we have a nice interdepartmental session today. And they're going to be sharing about some of the OER initiatives in the libraries. And I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you, Jenny. So this is Melody. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing us. Um, and we're going to be talking about OER, which stands for Open Educational Resources at UNCG Libraries and how we're saving students money on course materials. So I am joined today by Sam Harlow. It's me and Michelle Courtney. All right, so why open education? So you've probably seen this a couple of times. Um, it's something that we use often and other um, OER advocates use, um, but it's just a really good graph that sort of shows like the impact of um, educational books and the costs on students. So uh, you see there's a percentage change since 1978 for educational books and you can kind of see that compared to medical services, new home prices and consumer price index. And you can see there that educational books um, is the highest percentage change at 100 or sorry at 812 percent. Um, and that's sort of the late 70s to um, just uh, beyond 2010 it looks like. And that's from the um, uh, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I actually just um, recently read a newer statistic that sort of has a scope from 1967 to current day or 2019 really um, and that has actually increased to 1934 um, percent increase so as you can see that's incredibly high especially considering that we know like medical services have gone up a lot um, and then you can see here, there's this uh, illustration um, where there's these uh, parents, you know, and they say, move back home. Kids today are so lazy and irresponsible. Your mother and I started out with nothing. And the person here has a shirt on that says 20 and 30 somethings. And it says, trust me, I would have loved starting out with nothing. And you can see they have this large student debt on their back. So, um, in a student public interest group report um, from 2016, uh, there was a survey of 5,000 students and um, basically they found out uh, that uh, nearly one third, so 29.7% of students from this report used financial aid to pay for their textbooks. Um, you know, which is something that I think that we all sort of know and we know is pretty common. Um, not everybody has, you know, roughly $800 out of pocket that they can spend each semester for books or um, have family that uh, can help with that. So um, a lot of students do count on their financial aid uh, refund checks to pay for their textbooks. Um, but that means that uh, using those loans would pay, students would pay an additional $34.72 um, per $150 textbook. So that's something to consider as well. So the reality of student debt is that the average borrower owes more than um, $28,950,000 in student loans, and that's the class of 2014. Um, so this is, you know, obviously a huge financial stress for folks. Um, and it's not just, you know, that they have to pay off the student debt. It also affects other milestones in their life. Um, whether or not, you know, they can consider uh, getting married or owning property or having ch children even um, could be determined by how much debt they already have. So according to um, this uh, survey that was conducted by the Florida Distant Learning Consortium, um, it was a statewide survey. Uh, it sort of shows how uh, in your academic career, the cost of required te textbooks caused you to, you know, and it lists these like certain things. And you can see um, uh, there's response, responses from 2012 and 2016. And a lot of these numbers are remaining fairly consistent, if not getting higher. Um, so you can see that 66.5% of the students um, said that they didn't purchased the textbook at all in 2016. 47.6% um, took fewer courses. 
um, 45.5% didn't register for a specific course, which, you know, then could either delay their graduation or um, have one semester be uh, more loaded than it would be um, because they've put off putting, you know, having to take a specific course, if especially if it was necessary for their degree. Um, almost 40% earned a poor grade. Uh, they just dropped the course or they failed a course. So we can see that this is a student success issue. So how are we seeking solutions at UNCG libraries? Well, one thing that uh, we've done is that we've worked with the provost's office in creating this textbook affordability mini grant. Um, so you've probably heard us talk about it. Um, we call it the OER mini grant as well. But some things about the mini grant is that it encourages the creation of new uh, teaching materials, the use of library subscription materials, or the use of existing open or free um, information resources to support our students' learning. So the thing to remember here is that, you know, even though we do call it the OER mini grant, um, you don't have to use a true like open educational resource to get this grant. Um, the goal is to just make um, the course more affordable for students um, while considering educational materials. So like it mentions here, you could use library subscriptions, you know, in lieu of a textbook or something like that, and that could count toward the grant. So we do have this one example um, from, I'm probably going to butcher this person's name, I'm sorry, Dr. Bob Anemone, Anemone um, who uh, replaced, a, you know, an expensive textbook with this essential skeleton for free app. Um, so that was, you know, something that was uh, probably close to $200 that was replaced with an app. I'm not exactly sure how much the app cost, but I believe it was um, like a $10 purchase. So you can see that it's like significantly cheaper. Um, and that is something where, you know, this instructor got that grant to do that. So some student survey quotes, um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, basically the uh, responses are pretty good in terms of um, students who are in courses where um, instructors uh, did the grant. Um, you know, I believe that this method of teaching is great and I have learned just as much as I would using a textbook. And that's something that's pretty common with um, uh, research on sort of open educational uh, materials used in the classroom is that uh, generally students feel like the uh, material is comparable, if not better. So one new thing that Sam and I worked on um, since we took over this initiative from Beth Bernhardt, who was doing it previously, was that we uh, decided to host this Open Educational Resources Week. Um, and this was the week prior to the due dates for the um, mini grant applica application. So it was a way to like do hold workshops for faculty and also just, you know, have other um, advocacy programs that could help uh, enlighten people about open educational resources. So um, Sam did an open pedagogy webinar, which was really great. We held um, two separate workshops for faculty who were interested in applying for the grant, sort of explaining what they had to do, answer any questions that they might have. And then we also hosted a panel of past grant winners um, that could sort of talk about their experiences, maybe some lessons learned, um, what advice they might have for other people, et cetera. And then another thing that uh, we really wanted to focus on was how open educational resources could um, relate to student success and like we've seen the numbers and we know that it does affect student success. So um, I personally wanted to get uh, student success stakeholders involved in the conversation. So one thing that I did was I set up meetings with the Associate Vice Provost for Student Success and the Assistant Vice Provost for Student Success Initiatives to talk about open educational resources. And um, uh, I, both of them are actually advocates of OER in general, um, some knew more than others, but uh, the Associate Vice Provost for Student Success was already involved with OER's uh, work uh, from his previous institution, and the Assistant Vice Provost for Student Success Initiatives, Samantha Rayner, uh, was really excited to hear what we had to say. She had a lot of interest in how 
Um, it could specifically maybe help transfer students because that's something that she sort of has a, a passion about. Um, she was also really helpful in brainstorming ideas for um, the OER Valentine's Day pop-up event, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then uh, we uh, held a workshop for students, the Student Success Department. So one thing that we wanted to do during the OER week that we had um, was do a specific workshop for the student success stakeholders that uh, sort of has a focus on advocacy. Um, unfortunately, um, I was told by Samantha Rayner that uh, it was kind of just a busy time for them. It was the end of the, um, of the January month. So they were just really busy. And so she was like, how about we invite you to one of our student success department meetings and obviously turnout would be better then. So unfortunately I wasn't able to make that meeting, but Sam went um, and just a couple of notes from that. Uh, they were really interested in our relationship with the bookstore, which um, I believe Michelle will be talking about a little bit later, but uh, Sam assured them that, um, you know, the OER uh, mini grant by no means is like anti bookstore. The bookstore is not, you know, anti uh, open educational resources and that we actually have a really great relationship with them. And then they were also interested in sort of the impact of OERs on entry level courses, because I think there was maybe some misconceptions that uh, OERs were sort of for higher level courses, but um, in fact, entry level courses are really great because oftentimes those are um, large classes with, you know, 60 plus students and several sessions. So, uh, you know, the, the cost impact is um, higher. Um, and then uh, I really wanted to do something different for um, sort of a student centered OER program that wouldn't just be a workshop um, because I didn't think that students would, you know, on their own show up to an open educational resources workshop. So instead, um, with the help of, you know, uh, Samantha Rayner, like I mentioned, um, she helped me brainstorm this. Um, I came up with this idea of doing a Valentine's Day pop up event. Um, and basically the idea was that um, I would just set up shop in the middle of the library, sort of across from the reference desk um, where the current literature is. Um, because there's a lot of foot traffic that goes through there, um, I would just hand out Valentines to students and the Valentines would have some information about open educational resources. There'd be free coffee and hot chocolate and snacks for them to grab. Um, and basically, yeah, not trying to like, stop students and like give them a whole speech about open educational resources and sort of like hold them hostage until they listen and then give them stuff just like literally give them stuff and let them move on with it um and by doing that i ended up you know a lot of students ended up asking about it anyway um and the turnout was actually really great so um this is what that valentine looked like um the front of it says, wish you could break up with expensive textbooks, fall in love with OERs. And then on the back here, it says OERs are free alternatives to expensive textbooks. So again, I don't want to overload, I didn't want to overload them with information. I just wanted to, to give them the information that would matter the most to them. And that's, uh, hey, there, there might be these free alternatives to these expensive textbooks that I have to pay for. So just like a quick definition of what open educational resources are, and that's the definition that's on our LibGuide. Um, sort of, you know, uh, the rate of infl inflation for textbooks. Um, and then also, you know, uh, you know, lightly encouraging them to maybe inquire about it, to ask their professors or librarians about alternatives to expensive textbooks. And then there's a link there for them to find out more information if they chose to. So I printed a bunch of these out and I also um, bought these uh, Valentine's Day conversation hearts. And this was actually um, Jenny Dale's idea. Um, I didn't know that you could make custom conversation hearts, but I found um, a website that did it and you can see it says OER and it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there's the emoji face and it's, it's the one with the like money eyes and it's got a tongue sticking, a green tongue sticking out. <laughs> Um, so I bought some of those because I did get funding from Mike, which was really great. Um, and um, 
I individually, individually package them and tape them to the card so that there was even more of a chance that students would interact with the card. Um, so I did that times 150 or <laughs> however many cards there were. Um, so on the day of, this is me, I, I set up shop here and uh, these are the first um, students who came up and got some stuff and they uh, were nice enough to pose for me here. But you can see there's Valentine's goodie bags on the table, there's some extra cards, some donuts and treats and stuff. Um, so this was done on a Friday and um, you probably know that Friday is, have, we have a little less foot traffic in the library. And I think this actually kind of worked uh, to the benefit of the event because it was a two hour event. And um, honestly, if there wasn't the sort of staggered time uh, where students were in classes, um, I think all of the materials would have been gone within the first 20 minutes, but we were able to make it last. Um, but by the end, everything was completely gone. So. Um, here's another image of students sort of walking by. You can see that some students are uh, waiting in line to get some stuff. And then uh, there's this guy on the right who just has a goodie bag, has grabbed it and is moving on. And then we also had this whiteboard that said, um, what would you buy if you didn't have to buy expensive textbooks? Um, so we left this up throughout the event and then it stayed up for the rest of the weekend. And this is what it looked like when I came back on Monday morning. Um, you can see a lot of students interacted with it. And one thing that they like to do is like they'll circle something that somebody has said that they agree with or put checks next to it or stars um, if they like really agree with it. Um, and you can see that uh, some of these things are sort of, um, sort of fun things and then other things are uh, things that, you know, are necessities, but all in all, it sort of relates to quality of life. So a couple of things that I highlighted, I highlighted um, were travel. Travel was something that came up a lot of times. Uh, vacations, plane tickets, um, paying off loans and credit cards was something. Um, food came up often um, and sort of kind of in a bleak message, like sort of under, um, I don't know if you can see it in the image, but there's one mention of food and then underneath in parentheses it says to survive so it's kind of intense um clothes came up often um k-pop merch and bts tickets came up which i thought was really cute um i think that uh uh in terms of students i interacted with it does seem like a pretty popular thing at uncg's to be into um korean pop music um somebody wrote books that i want to read um, another person wrote a car for my mama, um, kitchen supplies, uh, some nice shoes, some nice kicks, Rick Owens dunks. So uh, shoes came up pretty often. And one that I thought was really interesting was more stock in companies, which you know then was like underlined and circled because um, I certainly didn't know anything about stocks when I was an undergrad. So I thought that was really interesting. But that was a little bit about that event. So. I am going to turn it over to Sam now. Okay, so I'm assuming y'all can hear me. I'm gonna look at the chat and maybe see yes and keep going. I, yes, okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, all the UNCG resources at work, as well as um, really define OER. Uh, when we do this, we do this a lot for faculty who are teaching or um, instructors teaching, whether face-to-face -face online. Uh, so we readapted the slides for this, but um, us as librarians also when creating online learning objects, when thinking about um, our lib guides or websites or anything that we make a video telling people how to use our services, uh, we can make our stuff open too. But there's a lot of UNCG resources at work when we think about faculty uh, doing OER in their courses. So it's not just us librarians in terms of helping them find um, materials to replace expensive textbooks. Um, that's usually how we talk about it in terms of saving our students money. Uh, but there's also all these different services, right? So we have consulting where uh, library liaisons in ROI and uh, Sarah in SHML, and um, I think uh, Gerald is one of them in administration, uh, reach out to faculty uh, to think about what they need to get rid of textbooks in their course. 
Uh, we can help them find resources, right? So like when they apply for these OER grants and get them, uh, we call them OER light grants because we don't require it to be purely OER materials, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, just as long as they're getting rid of a textbook, uh, that is what we're asking for, um, as well as creating new content. So we can help with all of that. Um, but in terms of creating new content, there's a lot of people on campus that can help, including instructional technology consultants. So every um, academic department at UNCG has one of these. Um, we also, of course, have the great digital media commons here in the library. Uh, they can help students and uh, faculty uh, create online learning objects. The UTLC is the University Teaching and Learning uh, Center or Commons. Uh, they help with like online pedagogy and putting things online, as well as the bookstore. Like Melody mentioned, uh, the bookstore is not our enemy in textbooks. They are our partner. And uh, they want students to use them and they were happy to have students uh, saving money by finding alternatives to expensive textbooks for teachers to use. Um, of course, we also have access to resources. So we push and um, rely heavily upon uh, circulation and electronic reserves for library materials, again, in terms of getting rid of a textbook. So many of you here I know are from this department, so you know that uh, electronic resources are not that we can, reserves are not just that we can put a whole textbook online, only portions, sometimes small portions. Uh, so we really do uh, work with them to help make faculty understand that. And we also work with faculty once they apply for these grants and get them or if they're just interested in converting their course to OER about licensing materials. So again, um, thinking about how they could uh, do that and also copyright. So um, Anna's in here and we can, um, you know, sure. Um, so there's some overlap between OER and open access. So if you have questions about that, we can um, talk about it at the end, uh, but we promote open access as well as an alternative again to these uh, textbooks. But again, it's a little different than OER. So next slide. So we talked about this a little bit, but just to be clear, um, instructional technology consultants or ITCs help faculty and help us with Canvas training, designing and planning for an effective online course, accessibility requirements for courses and flipping your classroom. So when we do these um, workshops for faculty members to help them again uh, use OER better, we usually bring in an ITC into there. And uh, usually it is Anita Warford, who is the ITC for the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, but again, we can have others. We also bring in the DMC to talk about their services. So we really try to show our faculty again to promote them getting rid of textbooks uh, all the different resources they have on UNCG's uh, campus so now I'm going to talk about like what are purely OER materials and where do I find them so this is kind of backing up from talking about all the different stuff that we do here at UNCG from the libraries in terms of uh, education about OER programming for students and faculty. So uh, Melody mentioned we've done programming for the student success offices. Uh, she recently did programming for students with the Valentine's Day pop-up. And again, we're, we are readapting our slides right now where we do workshops for faculty. But um, a lot of this is just to tell people about what OER is. So one confusion that sometimes happens with OER, open educational resources, is that people think, well, it's just free stuff, right? Like, so we can just use anything from the internet. If you wanted to actually use something that is purely OER, open education resource, it needs to have this five R's framework. So it's not just free online, it's about copyright. So something that is truly OER and is online means that anyone can take the materials online, retain them, reuse them, revise them, remix them, and redistribute them. So just because you put a website online or make something for online, um, most people would not assume that they could then take your video, cut it up, and use it for their own purposes. But for something to be truly OER, you can. Um, so next slide. So OER stuff is not just textbooks. That's another thing that sometimes uh, is uh, misunderstanding. They can be anything that have those five R's on them, right? That are that kind of open material that can be reused, remixed, readapted, and um, all that stuff. So um, they can be syllabi. They can be modules within Canvas or whatever LMS your university is using. They can be assignments, learning objects, right? So we've had faculty for these grants when they get them make videos, uh, use YouTube. Uh, they can also be collections. 
Uh, they can be video libraries, like I said, uh, YouTube. And then they can also be software, calculators, analytics, right? So OER can be all these different things that make up course materials. So again, we talk about textbooks a lot because usually that's what gets students' attention. That's what gets faculty attention. Uh, when we do surveys about course materials, usually uh, you know, students talk about textbooks. But again, they can be any of these things. So one way that you yourself or anyone, faculty, students, um, us as librarians can make it clear that we're okay with what we made online to be open is using Creative Commons licenses. So um, they have a great website, which I'll try to drop in the chat in a little bit, um, but so I can go back one. Uh, Creative, Common okay. Creative Common licenses, you are free to copy, share, edit, mix, keep, use the license. So um, on the next slide, it talks about uh, which license, uh, which one, which what everything means within a Creative Commons licenses. So y'all have probably seen these on a website before or on a libguide or on an infographic, um, but this is what the different symbols mean. So the little person is attribution. Every Creative Commons license ha requires that. Um, so that means you're gonna, you're cool with people copy, distributing, displaying, um, using your stuff really however they want as long as you give credit um, when you do it. So every Creative Commons license asks that of people using um, stuff, um, OER stuff. So the share alike says you would like other people to distribute the work in the same way that you distributed. Um, so I have used this in the past. I recently learned some people don't like this because it means that like companies can't use your stuff or like open textbooks can't use their stuff because they can't necessarily put the same license on there. Uh, but again, it's a commonly used things to keep materials open, right? Um, so then you have non-commercial. That would mean if you put this, if you see this on this anti-money sign on there, money with a slash through it, it means you're fine with people taking it and using it however they want as long as they only do it for non-commercial purposes. So they couldn't like put it on a t-shirt and sell it or they couldn't take your video, put it in their own video and sell it, anything like that. And then lastly, the equal means no derivative work. So this would be the most uh, tight license you could put on it, right? So if you saw all four of these together, it means that you want attribution, you want it to be shared alike, which means that it is non-commercial, it cannot be used for a commercial, but also people cannot cut it up and use it. Um, so people can copy, distribute, and display it, but they can't make derivatives from your work. So this is the four, the, the, sorry, the six uh, ways that you can see the license. So the one on the top left corner is the most open you can do, right? So that means that you would want it just, you just want attribution. But other than that, people can do whatever they want with your work. Um, the next one is really common, especially within libraries, where they're saying that it is an open work, it is an OER open work, right, where you want attribution, but you want someone to share it the same way as you, which means you would have to go in and get the license and make it clear that, you know, you reused it in this way. So, um, the mo I'm not going to go through each one of these, but the least open is what we talked about before, right, where you would say no derivatives. So here's an example of what it can look like on a website. So on this website, right, they are doing um, not the least open, but they're, they're closing it down a little bit where they're saying they want attribution. Again, all CC licenses have this. Um, and then they have this NC, uh, sorry, no commercial and then share alike. But they're saying you could do derivatives, right? So they're saying you can take this, you can use it however you want, you can you know, cut it up, do derivatives, as long as you're not using it for commercial purposes and you share it uh, with an attribution of where you got it from. So here's, you know, again, another kind of scale of the most free, right, to the least free. Um, and I would even say not free necessarily, but most open to the least open. Uh, so on here, we have a link to the Creative Commons website um, that I'll try to throw in a chat in a little bit. But we also have a link to the UNCG Scholarly Communication Lib Guide on here, which talks a little bit more about copyright um, as well. But the OER guide uh, that we are going to share in a second also has a tab where it kind of goes into even more detail than I just did on Creative Commons licenses. So here's that guide. Um, so Melody, do you mind going into the guide just for a second? 
So this is um, the guide. So I just wanted to point it out, if you haven't been here in a while, um, and I think all of you in here know this, but in case not, um, Beth Bernhardt used to run OER, um, but with Beth leaving UNCG, uh, Melody and I took it over as a team, and Michelle helps us, and has always helped, uh, helped Beth as well with the OER by subject, which Michelle is going to talk about in a second. But if you um, haven't been here in a while, it might be good for you to go here, because we, uh, Melody and I did meet, and we did kind of, uh, we got rid of some duplicate material, we added some stuff about uh, her Valentine's Day pop-up. Um, we also uh, I went through the Creative Commons guide, which is linked on here, and uh, updated the materials made sure it was accessible, um, added in the um, Creative Commons Choose licensing. Um, so this is a really nice tool that I like. I'm going to pull it up real fast and drop it in the chat. But um, Creative Commons Choose is a way that you can make your own license. So you just go on here and you it just asks you, like, are you cool with allowing adaptations of your work? And then it gives you the actual um, license, and including an embed code and including a place where you can put your own metadata in it. So um, it's if you haven't used it before, it's pretty cool. And that's usually what we use in ROI to put um, things on our online learning objects uh, to make it clear that it's open. So for example, we just recently put one on our new uh, research tutorials, uh, which we, we're in a soft launch right now, but based on what's going on, uh, maybe we'll make it a, a harder launch. But if you go to that website that I just dropped in the chat, uh, liveapps4.uncg.edu slash tutorials. You can see how we've put um, a Creative Commons license on those to make it clear that other librarians could totally use our stuff and how they can use it. Um, and we put an attribution in there so people know how to share it. So that's an example of how we as librarians and y'all, no matter what you're doing online, could put the same stuff on there. So... I have another slide. Okay, so now Michelle's going to talk, and I'm going to meet myself. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Michelle. So once we all started kind of teleworking from home, um, Melody and Sam um, approached me and asked me if I wanted to contribute to um, the OER libguide that was just displayed, and um, to add individual resources um, by subject. Um, and we got input from liaisons as uh, keywords to help me um, search in various places like OpenStax, um, the DOAJ, which is like the directory of open um, access journals, and um, lots of other places that I haven't even begun to start searching yet. Um, so if you go back there, I've build out the one for anthropology um, so far because that's the one that had like the most resources. And at the top, I have uh, kind of, was it Matt um, from the course adopted text um, for the spring, um, which requires a UNCG login, which us as the library um, has purchased of uh, exact ebook duplicates of um, textbooks that uh, uh, professors have assigned. Um, so if you keep scrolling down, um, I started on a list of journals and the little I next to the titles of the journals um, gives a little blurb of the description um, of each and further down. I'm going to have to reorganize this. This is very kind of early development. Um, I've started to link some textbooks and eventually I'll get to the ebooks. Um, but there's a lot of information out there um, and a lot of resources as well. Um, so if we go back to the slides. So um, as uh, this is everything that's going to eventually be included in um, for each subject, journals, ebooks, kind of the catch-all lectures, tutorials, and online courses that are freely available. And um, each semester, I'm going to be updating each of those subjects with the course adopted text um, for each subject and department um, that we are able to purchase and um, uh, provide to faculty and students. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so 
what does this have to do with the bookstore? We've back when Beth um, was in charge of OER, we had a grant with um, actually ECU um, that provided uh, monies to work with the bookstore to start purchasing, um, filling in the gaps for unlimited and free to use for um, students. So around two months before the next semester, um, of course, right now, actually just got the list from the bookstore actually. Um, and even though it's kind of late, but that's because of all the pandemic stuff. Um, so basically they send me a list in a text format and I have to edit it and um, make it readable. And then I start searching in our um, purchasing um, wholesaler um, website, uh, which is Gobi YBP in case anybody's curious. Um, and then I start to identify uh, possibilities of um, books that we can purchase, which that'll explain on the next slide, but um, we'll stay here for a minute. And um, then I share it with Ann Owens, who's our purchaser, who quick shout out to her in the, who's in this, uh, who's in this uh, webinar. Um, she goes through it and verifies it because from when I search and identify um, unlimited access to that we're able to purchase, she, uh, by the time that she goes through it, the licensing might have changed. Um, publishers quickly catch on to whether or not something's being used as a textbook and um, will limit the license from unlimited to a three user um, license. And then she goes ahead and purchases it. Um, she lets me know which one she was able to purchase. And then um, once we get the links, uh, I share it with all the faculty member and then I update. Um, there's a course adopted LibGuide, which I did not put a link in here and I apologize, um, of all the departments and the sections um, for the eBooks that we're able to provide um, for their textbooks to help students with their debt. Um, so in the, just for in the spring, we've had 279 electronic textbooks available for students. Um, and then, um, so that's what we were able to provide this current semester. Um, we also share a master list of everything that the bookstore is able to send us. Um, we definitely made it very clear with them that this is like an option. This is not to replace anything that they're doing. Some students actually like to have both um, ebooks and um, print, um, print for at home and then ebooks for when they're on campus. Um, but also I create a master list that I share internally with um, folks from ILL and reference so they can help um, patrons um, to be able to say, hey, this is a textbook. We won't be able to get it through ILL. Check out our course adopted textbooks guide. Um, so yeah, that's basically everything on the slide. So we can go to the next one. Um, so the criteria for purchase, we have to make sure that the publisher and the edition matches exactly. Um, professors don't exactly like if you know, like for example, the Odyssey. Well, there's several different translations and publishers that have put out an edition of the Odyssey. But so everybody can, um, in the class can kind of, you know, stay with the right around page numbers and all that sorts of things. We have to make sure that the publisher and edition match. Um, so publishers that are really good about having eBooks and unlimited user access are typically your university press titles. Um, so that covers and touches bases with a lot of the humanities and some social sciences. Um, so items that are published like by Cengage, Pearson, those sorts of um, publishers, we are not going to be able to uh, get access to those or purchase licenses for those. So the platform, um, another criteria is that um, it has to allow for unlimited user access to, and also allow, to a certain degree, um, download and printing of book chapters. Publishers are starting to open up to have more people access their materials online for us textbooks, but they're still kind of stingy about printing book chapters. Um, but there, anybody can 
access the book at the same time to view online and download um, the whole book. Um, there's also an option to download individual chapters, but for some reason they put restrictions on that as well. Um, and the main, main platforms that we have been using are ProQuest Central, which um, a lot of students really like because they can highlight, add notes, um, and do a lot, you know, to keep track of their work um, on the actual platform. But also JSTOR, um, Cambridge, Oxford, and EBSCO, um, they offer, um, that's the main platforms that we use. Um, and then also when we first started with the class, uh, with the grant, um, which is I think back in 2016, we had to prioritize class size. Um, so we wanted to reach more, we, we wanted to have a more impact on, you know, as many people as possible. But now as um, time has passed, a lot of professors reuse their course materials in their textbooks. So we haven't had to purchase as much as the semesters, um, you know, go on. Um, and that comes out of our collections budget supplemented by um, some funds from the provost option, uh, office, excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So here's um, the student impact on savings. Um, so 2016, we had at that point 307 um, textbooks that we had already owned um, that I had identified. And then we purchased an additional 157. Um, and you can see the pricing there and the uh, stu total students enrolled. Um, oh, that's good to know, Alyssa. Um, Alyssa says that she's noticed that books have restrictions on printing will usually forget you and allow additional printing and downloading later. Later, I did not know that, so that's actually really useful when faculty ask me those questions. Um, and as you can see, the numbers have increased for the, per, uh, the amount. Um, they fluctuate for some reason in 2017, 2018, we had a lot, and then from 2018 to 2019, it was decreased. Um, I don't have any figures. This is all from Beth right before she left. Um, I don't, obviously the school year from 2019 to 2020 is still happening. Um, so I don't have those figures as of yet. Um, and then the total savings for student is close to $1.4 million. Um, if all the students did not purchase their textbooks, which we know that um, they do. So and a lot of times when after to follow up on when I do email faculty members, which I do every semester, um, they'll actually follow up and ask for help for, do you have this textbook or this ebook available for purchase as well? So it kind of opens that door um, to OER for actually ex um, exploring more OER resources as well. So it's kind of like the gateway. Um, most faculty I have noticed um, from when we first started, it was about, it was kind of more of a mixed response. The majority of faculty have always been excited and happy that we were able to provide um, electronic versions of textbooks. Um, some faculty, it took some uh, finessing and they have eventually warmed up to the idea of e-textbooks. Um, and so now it's kind of like pretty much mostly positive. There are a couple of outliers that I'm trying to work on, but, um, but we're making it work. Um, so that's it for this slide. And that's the end of my piece. Um, so yeah, obviously we can encourage the creation of new teaching materials, especially in this uh, period where a lot of people are telemarketing. Um, electronic resources and the freer the better um, is most important. So, um, does Sam and Melody? And I made this slide um, just to talk really fast about um, uh, o, um, OER and uh, the coronavirus. Um, so, um, Michelle, can you stop sharing for a second and I'll pull it up? Or no, sorry, Melody. <laughs> Melody. Um, so I think if you just go down, then I, as the host, can share it. Um, uh, okay. 
share screen. Sorry. Sorry, this is my daughter's schoolwork. Okay, so y'all can see this. Um, I made this uh, like right before this, so I don't think it got like uploaded to the Google Slides. But um, this is a meme I made. Uh, shout out to Melody for like, I think you're, Melody's the one who was like, oh, have you seen that meme? And I couldn't find it, so I made one. Um, but this is just, you know, the, the classic uh, boyfriend looking back meme of, uh, you know, OER has been around for a long time. And right now with what's going on in America with everyone moving online, a lot of publishers are offering discounts, um, free trials, um, it's a lot of trials, right? Where it, the access will go away uh, around May, right? When our semester is over. Um, but, you know, we've been doing OER for a long time. And I think that, um, you know, us all knowing about OER, promoting OER during this time is particularly important so that faculty can kind of think um, now that they're being forced to maybe move to an ebook or to, uh, you know, moving everything online, that uh, this is the time to look into OER repositories as well as, um, you know, uh, continue promoting OER, uh, really try to get faculty to think about making OER moving forward. Um, costs are coming to light to faculty who I think never thought about costs ahead of time. Uh, so again, this is just our like, you know, what ha is happening right now in terms of uh, things shifting, uh, thinking about it. So if we can get faculty to use OER and um, Anna Craft does a lot with open access and Scholarly Comm to educate them about the differences between OER and open access, um, publishers, these um, things about money, then um, it will be uh, make a big difference in the end. So we've been doing this. We all do it. Um, again, uh, Michelle, Melody, and I are just one team. We talked about Anne. We talked about Anna. We, I talked about all of the access services staff help us with this. Um, so keep that in mind as well. So that's my pitch. Um, I also wanted to show you that on this, um, um, I'm not going to show you this, but OER searching is where you can look at our OER repositories if you yourself want to look for OER materials instead of reinventing the wheel about something you're making to do with like information literacy or libraries or anything like that. It also links to you some directories of open access books and things of that nature. Um, we are constantly updating this as well um, when things come out. I am in an OER workshop uh, that uh, I actually would have been there now this week where I would have been in Minneapolis, but you know, life. So um, I'm not there, but I'm in an online class and things are being updated in that way. Uh, you know, so things will be up what I learned there. So, great. So I'll go back to here. Are there any questions? I haven't seen any questions come in on the chat, um, but this is a great time. People have questions for them to share those. Thanks, Sarah, for saying that my um, artistry of meme making was excellent. Yes, I want to echo Anna and say thank you so much for doing this. I have heard uh, about OER many times and every time I learn something new. So I am really excited about what y'all shared today. Um, so if no one has any questions, I will stop the recording.